Our first scripture reading together this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 1. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, None of your relatives has this name. Then they began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue freed and began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed, the hand of the Lord was with him. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from our hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God. The dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. These past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the whole idea of blessing in the Celtic spirituality, um, the Celtic, Celtic Christian tradition of spirituality. And what we've learned is that blessing is not just something that you receive as a reward for good behavior. It's not even something that identifies God as having a chosen per people over and above a different chosen people, like some people are blessed because they have certain things and other people are not because they don't. That kind of understanding is completely foreign to the whole idea of Celtic spirituality. And I hope it's beginning to become very foreign to all of us in this series. Because what they lift up in their understanding of blessing is that God is present with us all the time in every way in all things. Blessing is a way of being in the world, a state of being in the world. It's not something, something. It is an energy. It's a being present with all the time. And with that understanding, we can then open our eyes in a whole different way to be able to see how God participates with us in every moment of every day. And one of those ways that we do that is to look for what we call rites of passages. 
If God is present with us all the time, participating in our lives all the time, how do we mark those occasions in our lives? We all have special occasions in our lives that we kind of set apart with special words, special rituals or ceremonies that kind of mark our passages through life. We have lots of them that we've been through in our lives together. Even just uh, last week, we had baptisms, right? Baptisms are a way to put words and, and ritual with water and all those kind of prayers and everything and set it apart as something really holy, something special. So we have baby showers. We have first days of school. I don't know how many different pictures I saw over the last couple of weeks of kids' first days of school, right? I had one mother who said, I, I can't believe how much this really bothered me, but I take a picture of my kids every year in front of this school bus tree, and this year they're driving themselves, and there is no school bus tree. So she took a picture of an empty tree. <laughs> oh. Those are ways that we intentionally mark our passages through time. Confirmation, communion, when we reach a certain age, like for voting or drinking or sweet 16 for driving or any of those kinds of things, we all have kind of general things that we mark our way through life with, but we also have some individual things that aren't necessarily um, open to the general public. Like for instance, I went through an ordination ceremony. There are a lot of people that have gone through such a uh, ceremony, but not everybody does that. There are people that do special licensing for their occupations, or they get sworn into office, for instance. Those kinds of ceremonies are also ritualistic in marking our paths through life. So the idea of a rite of passage is a way of acknowledging that something special is going on and that God is a part of that life with you. Often those ceremonies have prayers and rituals attached to them. So Marsha McPhee, who is a United Methodist pastor and the author of this particular series, says this about rites of passages. She said, they come in many forms and are sacred thresholds into new and uncharted territories. These special once-in-a-lifetime moments, when surrounded in words and acts of blessings, provide us with courage and assurance that we are not alone and that our next steps are anointed and held by God. Meaning that God is with us all the time. And that our special prayers and ceremonies and rituals that we surround these acts with acknowledge that we're aware that God is there with us. Because whether we're aware of it or not, God is there and God is acting in the world. It is our choice to participate in that. And by using some of these rites of passages, we are opening ourselves up to seeking that presence of God in the world. I love that sacred threshold thing. But beyond Christianity, there are lots of traditions that do similar rites of passages, right? The Native Americans, for instance, have been doing spirit quests forever, where they send um, their youth out into the wilderness in order to connect with the greater existence to the, all of creation and maybe identify a spirit animal that will walk with them the rest of their lives in order to help guide them, give them wisdom and strength throughout their lives. That's a rite of passage ceremony. And the Amish community, they use what's called rumspringa, which literally means jumping up and down or moving about. And it, it, what it's apparently supposed to do is give the children of the Amish community a chance to fully enter into the outside world of the community in order to experience everything that could be experienced there. And that way, then they'll have an idea of what they've been missing or what they could be doing and still make that informed choice of whether or not they choose to be a part of the Amish community or if they choose to leave it. It would be their choice, but they can't make that choice unless they experience what's out there. So this is their rite of passage, their way of exploring life to its fullest, even though it seems like wild abandon, 
It's actually a chance to be very intentional about experiencing everything around you so that you can be a part of it and choose what your next steps are going to be. So rites of passages are one way to kind of mark an end of one way of living in order to step through a threshold into a whole new way of being in the world. That's these special moments that we're talking about today. And often these kinds of moments are celebrations or times of joy in our life. But often we have rituals and, and commemorations around times in our lives where we are continually struggling, like sobriety, for instance. They have coins that mark how long you've been sober. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful rite of passage to be able to walk with someone through that passage and be able to mark time as an honored thing. I know several people that are constantly marking the days that they are cancer-free. It's a fabulous way to walk through life with a prayer, with a special word and thought and recognition that God is with you on that path. We even have things like divorce ceremonies. And those are there because you are literally letting go of one way of life in order to step through to another way of life. And commemorating that as God being with you on that path and helping you guide your steps as you walk forward. It gives you uh, a rebuilding of your own self-esteem and your confidence as you walk forward, and it reconnects you to the community that has promised to be with you no matter what. And that includes God. Whenever we put words and ritual around the events of our lives, we have entered rites of passages and have moved through thresholds of sacredness. And that's what we're celebrating today. So think over your life so far and all the different rites of passages that you've been through either individually or as a community, maybe with your family, and stop and think about how you recognize that God was with you in the midst of those events. Our second scripture reading this morning together is from Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down? 
O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Oftentimes, some of these special moments in our lives are times when we stop and think about the struggles that we have together as a community, whether as a city or as a nation or as a faith tradition, where we commemorate our histories, looking back to see what we can learn from where we've been. And as we look back, we can mark those times throughout history where we were very aware of God's presence with us. Those commemorations can come in all different kinds of form. They can be daily conversations. They can be weekly uh, meetings. They could be um, annual holidays like Labor Day or Memorial Day. Those kinds of commemorations um, come to teach us something about where we've been not just so that we don't repeat where we've been, but also so we can remember who we are and whose we are and what we're called to be about in the world. As we look back and bring our past into our future, we then have the opportunity to walk through a different doorway this time around. We have the possibility for change and new creations and new choices in our lives. We commemorate big things like World War II and the whole Holocaust thing. We can look back even further into the, the uh, second to the sixth century where the Crusades were happening. It was a four century long struggle of the Christians to try to win back the Holy Land from the Muslims. Four centuries of violence and pain fighting for a piece of land. Faith clashes, like the Reformation that happened 500 years ago when Martin Luther and some of his other clergy friends got together and dared to question what the Catholic Church was up to. Not trying to start a new religion, not trying to start a whole reform movement or a whole new religion, but rather to reform a religion that already existed. It wasn't a chance to completely change stuff, but to walk through a different door in the same tradition. And yet it sparked a whole bunch of conversation. In fact, this year is the 500th year of the Reformation, and there are commemorations all over the world that are celebrating this fact. And Catholics and Lutherans and Protestants of all time are coming together to pray together for the first time in centuries. Those commemorations help us to rehearse where we've been and identify who we are and what we're called to be about in the world and maybe make a different choice this time around, a choice for peace and grace and love. 9-11, we, sell, we commemorate every year the, uh, the terrorist attacks that killed over 3,000 people. Last year we celebrated with our tri-faith partners on the grounds of the temple, Temple Israel, coming together to maybe reframe our story of clashing faiths to a story where we have reconciling faiths that can come together even in their diversity and find unity in God's love. So we took the old story and brought it with us and reframed it in a new way so that we could walk forward into a whole new type of future with one another. We hope to redo that circle of peace again this year. 
because there's so much violence in the world. Last weekend in Charlottesville, three people died in rallies where rallies and counter rallies were all happening at the same time. Senseless violence in some ways. Always. Tracy Blackman, who is a UCC minister, um, the National UCC Church, she was there with a bunch of uh, multi-faith clergy, and they were all together in a church worshiping as the counter-rally. That's what their counter-rally was, was to walk arm in arm down the street, go to a church, worship, and pray for peace. And while they were there, they were warned that they weren't allowed to leave the building because there were a whole bunch of uh, rally members that were coming with torches and baseball bats and surrounding the church. They were held captive in that church for 30 minutes before they could finally find a way out to safety. They had to be ushered out back doors into alleyways, into cars in order to get out. 30 minutes chanting, listening to hate and violence as they were praying for peace. And if you think that only happens elsewhere, the response to that happened right here in Omaha. In the exit to Ashland, there was a sign that said, for a race and nation chanting blood and soil. And we have a series of rallies that are coming here from white supremacy again in September 9th, here in Omaha, in Lincoln, in Millard. It's happening all around us. Last Thursday in Barcelona, Spain, the New York Times depicted that scene as being 13 people killed from a man driving a car this way through a crowd trying to hit as many people as possible, killing 13 and leaving over 80 bodies just bloodied in the streets. Violence and hate. We see it everywhere. How will we respond to this? How will we commemorate these types of stories? How we will bring this from our past into our present and reframe those stories in order to take a different step forward into the future? How are we called as a community of faith to speak the truth to hate? The very word gospel itself means truth. How do we speak the gospel to the world around us? Racial injustice is a sin. Anything that separates us from our brothers and sisters separates us from God, which is the very definition of sin. These may seem like political issues to all of us, but these are gospel issues. We are called by the very promise and love of God to speak the truth to hate and violence. This is a gospel issue. And we are people of faith. What will be our response to this? How will we speak love to the world around us? Remembering who we are, whose we are, and the identity that we have in our image of God is a very part of stepping forward. And David White talks about remembering, reaching back through those commemorations, those time passages in order to learn a new way. He says, remembering what we have forgotten is the first practical step home. The opening of a tidal gate that brings us into contact with the larger, stronger currents of existence. Exile and forgetting are natural states for most human beings, but so are remembering and recalling. As we move through our rites of passages, as we commemorate our past and our histories with one another, 
We are opening doorways that allow us to reframe our stories in a way that pushes us forward into the gospel, into truth-telling, into standing up against hate and violence and speaking words of love. As we listen to the music, I'd like you to stop and think about our role as a community, as an individual who takes their image from God, the very love of God in the gospel of Christ. And how do we speak that gospel to the hate and the violence all around us? Our final scripture reading this morning together is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know, we know him no longer that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Rites of passages are ways to mark an end of one way of being and stepping into a new way of being. And commemorations are types of those rites of passages that look back in our history and pull it forward so we can make a different decision this time around, a better choice. We are in the midst right now of a major paradigm shift in our world. Phyllis Tipple used to talk about it as the 500-year garage sale, where we would look back in our history and bring forward those things that we consider treasures that we can use to help us step forward into our futures. Pirates of the Caribbean says, you better start believing in ghost stories, Miss Turner, because you're in one. It's the same story. We're in the midst of a shift. And we are right now in our threshold moment. This could be our sacred time, our chance to change the story, to frame that paradigm shift in a way that moves people to love, to justice, to reconciliation with our brothers and sisters, even those who view God differently than us 
we can still speak to what brings us joy in our faith traditions and be listening when they do the same thing back. That's how we shift our stories. That's how we reframe how we move forward in the world. Try faith is a big part of our story. It is one of the best ways for us to reframe those old notions about how religion can do nothing but speak to exclusion and priority of one over another. This is our chance to reframe that story, speak to those millennials out there and all generations who are wondering if there's anything else faith could be doing besides starting wars. We have the opportunity and the chance right here, right now, this afternoon at the American Muslim Institute to be a part of a tri-faith picnic where we share our stories, we open ourselves up and share our traditions, not so that we can judge whose religion is better than the next, but we come at it through a sense of gratitude, open curiosity to find out what is it that brings them joy in their traditions and what might inspire our own. How do we speak our story and tell them what brings us joy? about Christ. These stories reframe the way we walk into our whole life, not just our tri-faith partners, but with everyone we meet. Hate has no home where love is the frame of the story. It is our calling. It is our threshold moment to change those stories. God is asking for us to participate in what God is already doing. God surrounds us all the time and in all things and in all ways. We need to be seeking eyes to see that, ears to hear it, and action that follow it into the world. It's not just a political movement. It's a response to the gospel. It is a call to be the truth in the world that speaks to anything but love. Our gospel message today says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled, God to God's, reconciled us to God's self through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. How will we reframe our stories in order to accomplish this? How will we speak love and gospel to hate and violence in order to turn it around so that when we commemorate it in the future, it gives us a different path to take. These stories will be rehearsed again in the future. How will they be heard? We get to decide that. We're part of that with God in the world. One of the most famous commemorations of our time is this table. We have a white cloth that goes over this table that has the words, do this in remembrance of me. Every week we celebrate the night that Christ was betrayed, where he took bread and wine and he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me that your steps forward will be in reconciliation. And again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. A new covenant in my blood that our ways forward 
will be one of love and peace and joy. Not hate, not violence, not senseless acts of terror. This is God's ministry in the world. How will we participate in it? By coming here every week and participating in this meal, all of us share in the ministry of God's love. And in this, we recognize that God is in it with us and guiding our steps every step we take. We're not alone on this journey. God's presence is with us. So as our uh, servers come forward to prevail this meal for us, let us rehearse who we are and whose we are. We are an inclusive, open, and affirming family of faith, welcoming all to God's table of love and acceptance. We are diverse, yet united by Christ's example. We care for one another, support one another, and challenge one another to become all that God creates us to be. We work together to nurture our community and to promote peace and justice in our conflicted world. We are the body of Christ.